perfect. So Kathy is a mycologist and professor at Montana State University, where she teaches and does research on fungi, the cold, this cold loving, the cold, the cold loving mushrooms that live in alpine and arctic habitats are her specialty, and she is involved in white bark pine restoration using native myco, mycorrhizal fungi to enhance seedling res, regeneration. She's the author of The Essential Guide to Rocky Mountain Mushrooms by Habitat, Fungi in Forest Ecosystems, and numerous journal articles. And um, I'm so pleased that we have you coming here to all of us today to speak because I've been looking for um, an expert in, on this topic and here you are, you just landed in my lap and I feel so grateful for that. So um, as you can see, the top result from our, why are you joining this webinar question is because people are most interested in arboriculture. Um, that's the top one, but there's plenty of other um, answers that are dispersed throughout there. So I'm going to stop sharing that so it gets off your screen and turn it over to Kathy. Okay, well, thank you, Megan. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for everyone joining us today. That was quite a large number of people that signed up for this. It was really interesting to see why you're joining us in terms of arboriculture or white bark pine research. I was happy to see 17% are interested in native mycorrhizal fungi, which is my specialty. So, I'm going to, what I'm going to do today is uh, give you a little bit of background in white bark pine ecology. Uh, it looks like quite a few of you know quite a lot about that, but we want to catch everyone up else up to speed because everyone is tuning in from all over the country. So I'll give a, a brief introduction to that. I'll talk a little bit about restoration, why, why it's important for white bark pine so you can get an idea of the system. And then I'll move to my research, which is on mycorrhizal fungi. And I'll tell you a little bit about the ecology, how we collect them in the forest, we process them, uh, use them for inoculation of seedlings in the greenhouse. That'll, we'll focus on that in the later part of the uh, webinar. And uh, then a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing. So let's get started. And I'll just tell you a little bit about white bark pine first. And you can see this big, beautiful tree right in front of you. So white bark pine is found only in, the, in Western North America. It's in just the few states shown on the map here in the Pacific Northwest over into our area in Montana. I'm coming from Southwest Montana. And then up into uh, Canada and that is the whole range of white bark pine right there. I can get this to change. Uh oh, it's not changing. No, I, I think, so click on the screen and then maybe use the arrow keys. Sometimes it, you just have to sort of wake it up. There you go. Uh, thank you very much. No All right. So for white bark pine is a high elevation tree found at tree line. And you can recognize it right at tree line. This is in our area. Um, in Montana because it has a broad spreading top. So all of the other trees in our area, spruce and fir, will have very pointed spire-like tops, whereas white bark pine will have those broad spreading tops. Usually uh, its range is from about 8,000 to 12,000 feet, and that's the only pine up there in our area and in a lot of areas in the west. Other pines, lodgepole pines, are found at a lower elevation, as is uh, Pinus flexilis as well. To recognize this tree, the easiest way is to look for the cones. Uh, it makes round purple cones, and they're often on the very tops of the tree. So if you uh, think you're in a white bark pine forest and you have a pair of binoculars, if you can't see that high, you can go up and look for those uh, round purple cones. It's a five needle pine, and we only have two five needle pines in our area here. So you'll see that the fascicles are in, uh, the needles are in bundles of five. It has a really light colored bark, and that's where we get that name, Alba, Pinus albicollis. Alba is white, collis is stem. So that white stem is another clue that you're looking at white bark pine. And these will make, uh, 
large forests can be pure forests of white bark pine, or we can have uh, just individual craggy trees on open slopes. What's really interesting about this pine, it's, it's different, it's really unusual, is that the seeds are dispersed by birds, mainly uh, Clark's nutcrackers, and these birds often plant in, in seed. Let me see if this little video clip will go here. Uh, there's no sound on this clip, but this is just showing you a nutcracker at the top of the white bark pine. He's picking out the seeds from the cone. The cones do not open. They stay closed. So when this goes down the bird, into the bird, it goes into the gullet. And when it goes into the gullet, the bird is not necessarily uh, digesting these. It's just holding them into the gullet. It flies off to cache these seeds. And it'll cache them from a few to quite a many. It can hold over 100 in its gullet. And it caches them in various places. And burns are one of its favorite places to cache these seeds. Uh, it's open. You can see a lot of markers here, stumps, logs. So when the birds uh, trying to cache and trying to remember where it's placed the seeds, the markers are there. Uh, and it's a good place to cache these because white bark pine likes these open sunny areas. So this is white bark pine's main dispersal mechanism, birds, nutcrackers. So if the nutcracker forgets some of the caches, uh, over the winter, doesn't need them for food when it goes back, those caches will germinate and they germinate in a cluster. So you see here about five or six seedlings coming up all together. When those, after those seedling germinates, look what happens. They'll eventually grow together. So you might see this tree in a forest and think it's just one multi-stem tree, but actually it's come from that seedling cluster and different genetic material has joined together at the base. So that's why a lot of times you'll see these multi-stemmed, magnificent white bark pine trees. The pine nuts are um, also important as a food source for bears, uh, brown bears, grizzly bears, and squirrels. And we have grizzly bears in our area and where the grizzly bears habitat overlaps with that of white bark pine, uh, folks think that the pine nuts are an important part of its food because of the high fat content right before hibernation. So um, the fate of the white, pine, the white bark pine is tied somewhat perhaps to the fate of the grizzly. Also, these mammals, the squirrels and the bears, eat mycorrhizal fungi, which I'll get to later. But you can see uh, mycorrhizal fungi in the lower corner here, and it's been nibbled on, in this case, by a small mammal, so probably a squirrel or something like that. And the spores are actually spread by mammals. It goes through, the spores go through their digestive tract, come out the other end, and are ready to go. So in this system, the seeds of the white bark pine are spread by birds, the mycorrhizal fungi are spread by the mammals. So it's a very uh, interesting system. However, there are a lot of threats to white bark pine. Um, more and more in recent days, we have the white pine blister rust is attacking these trees. Uh, the mountain pine beetle is another threat and these two can work synergistically uh, in some areas. Some areas we have more the rust than the beetle or the other way around. Fire exclusion may have contributed to the decline of white bark pine. It's a pioneering tree, and you saw that the birds are planting in those open areas. Um, it, it does not like shade, so any fire suppression might set white bark pine back, and then of course, climate change and warming conditions. It's a high elevation tree. It's up there at tree line. White bark pine's population has declined in many areas. Uh, it's maybe over 90% in some areas, it's gone in other areas, so it's a serious decline. We end up with uh, scenes like this. This is up in Glacier Park, and you can see we call these ghost forests. The boles of the trees are, are still standing, but the trees are dead, the needles are gone, and they'll persist for quite a while. This is uh, an area that I'm working in, the Gravelly Mountains in Montana. All those dead trees that you see 
are white bark pine. And 10 years ago, when I started my research, they were alive. So I've watched this decline as my research has gone on. The living trees in there, you notice, are pointed. Those are spruce and fir. So this is a, a fast-moving threat on the landscape. So because of that, we have a lot of restoration of white bark pine going on. Um, I put up the range-wide restoration strategy. Um, this was led by Bob Keane and Diana Tombeck. And the blue circles here talk about all the different ways, um, uh, strategies for restoration. But I'm just going to talk about just the ones that are important for my talk. So here we have gathering cones, extracting seeds, growing seedlings, and then planting seedlings. So the idea is to distribute these seedlings uh, across the landscape to replace what's being lost. And that process, I'll just mention briefly. I know that there are quite a few of you that are familiar with this process, but it's quite a complicated process. And I wanna make a point of that because cones need to be caged and in the fall so that the squirrels and the birds aren't um, eating them. And then those cones are actually collected, put in burlap bags, and they're actually tagged with where they came from, the seed zone, um, who collected them, or basically, I don't know if I want to call it the ownership, um, but temporary ownership of those cones. And then those seeds are removed by hand. The cones of white bark pine do not open. That's why they need the birds to go in and open those cones, release the seeds, and plant them. Here in the nursery, the seeds need to be removed one by one by hand. Then they're scarified in these coffee containers with sandpaper inside, and they're stratified. Sometimes that stratification process is quite complicated, and then they're planted in containers and they can be grown for as long as two years after that. It's a complicated process. The forest nursery in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho does a lot of that. Here you see hundreds, thousands of the white bark pine seedlings that they've produced. Um, they are the major producer and over the years, um, we get some of our seedlings for research here and work in some of our field studies with seedlings um, from the forest nursery. There are also nurseries in Canada uh, now producing white bark pine seedlings and other places. In Idaho, uh, some of these seedlings are exposed to the rust with a purpose. They're exposed to rust to look at some rust resistance trials here. And this is again at the forest nursery. And what folks are trying to figure out is when those cones were collected, were they collected from a tree that might have some resistance to the rust? So collecting those cones is rather selective, going to areas where the rust has uh, devastated a lot of that area. What trees survived? It's called a plus tree. I like to call them mother trees. And those trees are the ones that maybe, maybe have some resistance to the rust. So some of those seeds from the cones are uh, grown up into seedlings, subjected to the rust, and then we check to see, well, do they have any resistance or do they not? So after that whole process, it's probably around the 50%, little more, little less survival rate for all of those seedlings that have been planted. Now, this was done in a study back in 2007. And since then, we've learned a lot. So it's probably on average over 50% now. But still, it's kind of a disappointing survival rate um, that the seedlings would die um, within the few, first few years. Some of that's been improved. So here's what we've learned. Uh, we've learned that seedling survival rate is higher on burns and when planted near protective microsite habitat. So burns is sort of in a sense mimicking what the, where the nutcrackers are planting, plus it gets rid of the competing vegetation and opens the area up so there's more sun, there's 
less shade. And the survival rate is quite significantly higher on burned. The other thing we've learned is planting near protective objects. We call them microsites. It might be a stump, such as this burned stump in the photo. It might be a log or a down log. And basically, this is uh, protecting the seedling, maybe from uh, snow creep, et cetera, in our area. But planting near those protective objects really has increased the survival levels of white bark pine. So with all this going on, we thought for our research, started thinking about this. Can we use native mycorrhizal fungi to improve seedling survival? Let me go back one minute and just mention that when you have a burn, and especially if it's a severe burn, not a light burn, the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil are likely going to be devastated. They'll be gone. In some cases, if it's a light burn, we may still have some there. But when it's a burn of, of uh, definitely a severe burn, mycorrhizal fungi are basically gone. So why mycorrhizal fungi? What are they? So mycor means fungus, rhizal means root. So can we use these to improve seedling survival? Basically, you can see in the photo here, the fungi act to enhance the ones that we're talking about, nitrogen uptake. Now, maybe some of you have talk, heard about AM mycorrhizal fungi with other kinds of plants, and they're helping phosphorus uptake. This group, and these are ectomycorrhizal fungi, basically enhance nitrogen uptake. They can also protect against drought. They aggregate the soil, which helps uh, hold the moisture. So with nitrogen being pulled in from the soil by the fungus and up to the plant, the plants through photosynthesis are producing sugars and those go down to feed the fungus. So it's a two-way mutualism, everybody's happy. These are some of the structures that I might talk about um, throughout the talk now. So you see the root system here and coming off the root system are all these white strands or white hairs. That's called the mycelium. And basically, that's the body of the fungus. That is the main fungus. It's out of sight. We don't usually see it. The mycorrhizal fungi, uh, their mycelium is connected to the roots of plants, typically the short roots of plants. If we could look up cl more closely, right where these connections are, we would see structures that look like this. This is a mycorrhiza or an ectomycorrhiza. This is of a Sewillus fungus, which I'll tell you about later. The fungus actually makes those roots divide and proliferate. So you get this little hand-like structure, at least for this kind of fungus. So that's the mycorrhiza. This is where nutrient exchange plays. This is where it all happens. When the fungi reproduce, they might send up, depending on the fungus, a mushroom, and then we see it above ground, or it might produce a truffle-like fungus, which would be below ground. Those are the fruiting bodies, and those hold the spores, but the basic fungus body is made of the mycelium. That's where it's all happening. So we thought that this is how mycorrhizal fungi work. Maybe we could use them in the restoration process, and people have done this before. So in nature, just a little background. See, trees need mycorrhizae to survive in nature. That's a rule. In the greenhouse, you can fertilize. If you could look below ground in a forest, you would see many different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi and roots. So I've kind of magnified these different types. You can see at the bottom of your screen, you see the one on your far right is the one I showed earlier, but there's all different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi, even on one tree species. And each one of them is doing something different. They have a unique function. Some might enhance nitrogen uptake more. Some might be uh, better for helping in drought conditions. Uh, some might be better in protecting against certain pathogens. So they all work together with the tree uh, to benefit the tree. 
And some of these are host specific. Now, some of these you might also find on spruce and fir in the area, they could share. But some of those are only, these are only found on pines or only on white bark pines. So that's just ecology in brief. So when we started our research, what we wanted to know was, well, what is my, what fungi are mycorrhizal with white bark pine? So in our area, we covered three national parks, seven mountain ranges, did a survey to see what mycorrhizal fungi were out there. And, um, and you can see we're primarily located in Montana, and you can see uh, that we're also overlapping with the grizzly bear range here. So when we went out, now there won't be a quiz on this list, so don't worry about it, but uh, we found 50 different species of fungi that were mycorrhizal with white bark pine. Now this might seem like a lot, but when you consider that for Douglas fir, over 2,000 species have been found associated with Douglas fir. So we're still growing the list, but in our world, in our mycology world, that's actually a small number. But you only need to focus on those in the yellow box. So the yellow box are the sewilloid fungi. And these are the ones that we really wanted to focus on. Why? Well, first of all, they're host specific. Some of these are only found with pines. Some are only found with five needle pines. Some are only found with white bark pine. If we focus on host specific fungi, then we're not going to be adding anything that might benefit competitor trees. Luckily, these also happen to be mycorrhizal fungi that are found on seedlings and on mature trees both. That did not have, have to be true but it worked out. So notice Rhizopogon and Sewillus are the two main Sewilloids. And here they are, just to give you a little background. These are the ones that we found to be useful for inoculation of seedlings. Why? Well, the spores germinate in culture, so we could make a spore slurry inoculum from these, or the mycelium also grows in culture, and we could make a soil inoculum from these. And as I mentioned before, they associate with seedlings and mature trees. So we can add them to seedlings and they should join up. Plus they may persist for the life of the tree. They're also uh, host specific at some level. So what do they look like? Here's a suillus, suillus. Sui comes from the word pig, as you call pigs, suey. I'm not going to do the pig call right now. But suillus are like little pigs. They have a cap. It's often sticky. Looks mushroom-like. But it has pores underneath, sometimes called a sponge. Not the blade-like gills of most mushrooms. So the pores and sponge are what are really important here. The stem can be without these little glandular dots uh, or with glandular dots. That's basically a sewillus. They occur in many parts of the country. Uh, there are different sewillus species or different pine trees. This is the group that is rather specific. So if you're in another part of the country, um, we saw lots of people checking in from all over. So if you're in a pine system, you may see sewillus, those sewillus species may be specific to the species of pine that you're working with. Rhizopogon is a little bit more of a generalist, but it tends to like pines. Um, we do find it with some other trees. These grow underground. They're round, and when they're mature, you see the brown inside. So we call them pogies for short. So Sewillus and pogies are the two that we're interested in. So, how do we find these? What do we do with them? Um, basically, here we are out collecting uh, native mycorrhizal fungi in the forest, um, collecting Suillus above ground and Rhizopogon below ground. You can learn to uh, see it just cracking the soil a little bit and then dig down and pull out some of the, 
the pogies. Or you can see where the animals have been digging and they might leave little crumbs near the hole and then you can go down and see where they're at. So you can't just go out into a, a forest, uh, whether white bark pine or otherwise, and start collecting mushrooms and assume that they're mycorrhizal because they're near trees. Not true. There are a lot of saprophytes, there are a few parasitic mushrooms. You need to be able to identify the mushroom in order to determine if it's mycorrhizal. If you know it's a Sewillus or a Rhizopogon, they are mycorrhizal fungi. So let me show you some of our star performers that we're collecting out in the field. Uh, and this is our main star performer right here, Sewillus sibiricus. It also has a new name, Sewillus americanus, which I haven't quite wrapped my head around yet. So this is a Sewillus fungus, so all the features that I mentioned before are there, but the cap is bright yellow, egg yolk yellow. Now it can fade in the sun, but if you see something that's really bright yellow, and it has these red patches on the margin here, that would probably be Sewillus sibiricus. There's not I can't think of another species that does that. Underneath, we have these golden or yellow pores. If you look really carefully, they almost look like they're radially oriented. That's not important for our purposes. And then they have this um, yellowish stem, and sometimes it goes to pink at the bottom. When you handle these, sometimes you'll see, I'll get a little black on your hands. Um, it's another way you can tell you have Sewilla sibiricus. This is our top performer for our inoculations of seedlings. So the second one that also has worked pretty well for inoculation, Sewillus discolor. It's a uh, rather a uh, dull gold color. It looks almost a little bit scaly on top. Gold pores, gold stem with black dots, but when you cut it open, you can see some blue staining. You can almost see a little bit blue on the base of the stems here. Well, if you cut it in half, you'd also see blue right at the underneath the top of the cap and right inside the stem. This one can also work um, in restoration. So Willis subalpinus is also found in white bark pine forest, but it's a slow grower and we didn't have a lot of luck with it, at least in our studies. Um, for restoration. Brown cap, pale yellow pores, white stem with brown dots. Uh, it's only so far known from white bark pine forests and so far we think that this species is tied specifically to white bark pine. So since white bark pine is in decline, we actually now have this on our conservation list of fungi um, because if the pine goes this fungus will probably go. How important is it in the system? We don't know yet. And then I just have one rhizopogon here as an example. This is rhizopogon evadens. Um, it's round, it starts out white, and as you handle it, it turns rather a pinkish color. Uh, here in the lower right, you can see what I call a pogey hole. Uh, if you see a little cap or something sticking out of there, stick your hand in, pull the duff back, see if it's a, a rhizopogon hole. I've uh, stuck my hands in a lot of holes and found where the squirrels were stashing their cones and other kinds of holes um, with various things at the bottom. But you can learn to recognize the ones that are for the, for the pogies. So for a while, we had a citizen science program going. We had uh, mushroom clubs, park service employees, forest service employees, sending us sightings of these fungi from all over. Um, we put up a poster and we wanted to know where they found with white bark pine in their area. And so we got reports from all over and into Canada. And a lot of these same species are found uh, throughout the range of white bark pine. So we're not, the program is now closed, but it gave us a lot of good information. So thank you to, to those of you who sent that in. Okay, so here's a little bit on what we've been doing, a little the, the nuts and bolts. So the fungi are collected and we collect them in typically um, plastic boxes of various sizes, um, tackle boxes, 
um, things like that. Here are the rhizopogons in the upper left and the sewilloids um, in the other bins. We don't need a lot uh, of these fungi. A few will go uh, a long way. So we were maybe a little over exuberant this day, but if it's a hard year to find them and you do find them, you get excited because now you know this batch right here is probably enough for inoculation of for whatever we want to do for the year. And that was a one day of collecting. Although we might have visited 10 other sites that were dry and we, we couldn't find them. So when you come across something like this, um, we collect. But we try to leave some for the squirrels and, and the bears. So a little bit about selecting and transporting and storing mycorrhizal fungi. So for selection, you have to get just the right age. You don't, you want mature specimens because those are the ones that have mature spores and you need mature spores. But you don't want them so old and rotten that they're full of maggots and that can turn into quite a mess. So for rhizopogons, you want the mature specimens that are brown inside. It'll have like a pore-like surface in there. If it's brown, they're producing spores. If it's pure white inside, it's too young, there are no spores, it won't ripen up after you pick it. So you don't want it. Sometimes I might nick a couple or I can now tell which are immature, leave it in the ground. The Sewillus, on the other hand, what you want here is they'll be probably be producing spores, but they can get old pretty fast and they can get old and full of maggots, and you can see all the, the maggot holes here. If you collect these, so Willis are really amenable to rotting as, right after you collect them, and you may open up your box and just find a, a pile of wiggling little maggots. So you wanna cut a few open, see if they're pretty solid um, before collecting them, and, and a few old ones can spoil the batch, just like apples. So if you're collecting, um, baskets are fine, paper bags, boxes, plastic boxes. I forgot to mention wax paper bags are great, but not plastic bags. Plastic bags make the mushrooms sweat. They will rot. If you have any maggots, you'll have a lot more by the time you get home. And especially if you, you're hiking a long ways in the hot sun, you bring it in, you put them in the back of the car, where the sun is hitting it, um, they will rot and, and turn to mush. So no plastic bags. Whenever possible, keep the mushrooms cool. Um, you have a cooler in the car, great, get them in the cooler. And then when you get home, get them in the refrigerator as soon as possible, and then you wanna process them as soon as possible. So how to process them. So here's how we do our processing. It's a simple process, anyone can do it. So basically the idea here is we're removing and saving that spongy area underneath the cap. This is what contains the spores. We're discarding the stems and the cap where all the flesh are located. So um, here we have um, Bob and Joanne are doing the separation process and what they're doing is, in this case, they're using razor blades and scalpels. Now, you don't necessarily have to use razor blades or scalpels, um, but it can help because it's a layer and you wanna just slice it off and get rid of that flesh. So the flesh is here, it's gone. Um, they're not great for eating in case somebody's interested. They're not poisonous, but. I wouldn't recommend it. There are better edibles out there. Um, and then we save all that pore surface. Uh, when doing this process, you can get black fingers. There are a few people that can get a dermatitis reaction from it. We haven't had any problems. So basically we're going from this, the whole mushroom, to this. So here's that spongy pore layer only. For the rhizopogons, 
um, to slice them up. Notice that they're all mature, they're brown inside. If you have too many of the uh, pores of the Suillus or the rise of Pogon, you can put them on a food dehydrator. We have used dried material to make our spore slurries. And then what you're gonna do to make a spore slurry is gather a lot of this really fancy equipment that we have here, uh, about a 20 dolly coffee, coffee grinder and some glass jars and a funnel. Canning jars work well. Um, your fungal tissue and water. Now water, you don't wanna use chlorinated water. It can be um, spring water, distilled water. I forgot to put in well water here, um, but not chlorinated water. Fungi do not make chlorinate, like chlorinated water. So let me show you a little clip of what we do. And here's our materials. And we're taking about 50 milliliters. This is not an exact process of that pore surface. I'm just kind of measuring it out a little bit so I know how much, but again, it's not exact. And just put it into the coffee grinder. Add a little bit of the water to dilute that. And again, notice that it's not an exact amount. I'm just pouring some in. I'm making a point of that. And then give it a grind. Now, typically I would give it four or five grinds just for the purpose of the movie. I'm only doing it a couple times here, trying to dilute it out. But normally um, I'd go a little bit more and I'd add a little bit more water. And in the end, that's your spore slurry. And here again, since it's rather thick, I'm just gonna dilute it so that it goes down through the funnel. And that's it, that's the process. So now you have this thick, dark chocolate looking slurry with millions and millions and millions of spores per milliliter. They're tiny, there's a lot of them. So you need to dilute it. So basically what we do is use a hemocytometer shown here. And we put one milliliter of that slurry on the hemocytometer, count the spores in the box, calculate how many spores per milliliter to figure out how much we need to dilute it. I just thought that if someone does not have a microscope and this hemocytometer, take that dark chocolate. Usually diluting it about 10 times will give you milk chocolate slurry. And typically another 10 times you get about a tea colored slurry. So diluting, depending on how much material you use, you're looking for that tea color. And that's approximately, depending on the fungus, one million spores, more or less a few, right? We don't count them all per milliliter. And that's ready to go. And then it needs to be stored in the refrigerator. How long does it last? Well, it can be a few months uh, that we've discovered, at least. How to inoculate? Well, you can use, we use about three, now this is not exact science, um, you can use uh, different amounts, depending on what you're doing. We use three milliliters of that spore slurry. You can just take a pipette and drip it on the seedlings, on the surface or near the, right near the base of the seedlings. For larger projects, we use um, actually a cattle vaccination gun. You can go to your local store of vet supplies, that's where I went, look for a cattle vaccination gun that can be set to three milliliters at a time. And then you can just shoot three milliliters, three milliliters, three milliliters as you're going along to each seedling. And these guns shoot pretty well down into the containers. You can also shoot them all the way across the room. An alternative is to make a soil inoculum for those of you who are familiar with sterile culture and you wanna maintain one particular strain of fungus. You just break open the fungus, take a piece of tissue, throw it on the Petri dish, take a piece of that mycelium, add it to liquid media, grow it in liquid media, blend it, add it to sterilized peat vermiculite, let it grow down, that's your soil inoculum. 
and you can just add that by the spoonful or mix it into the soil when you're transplanting for the soil inoculum. That's more complicated. If everything goes right, this is what it should look like. You should have start to see little white structures on the roots of the seedling. And if you look more closely, they look like little hands. And here you see that close up again. This is the Sewillus mycorrhiza. So this is a pretty well colonized seedling when everything goes right. Well, everything doesn't always go right. So here's a little bit about what we've learned. I like these three circles here because we have the plant, that's the white bark pine. We have the fungus, we're using Sewillus in this case. You need the right kind of soil and other conditions, I might add, in order for mycorrhizae to form. So here's a little bit about when to inoculate, how, conditions, what will be learned. I'll just run you through this real quickly. Um, container size, short or long, seemed fine. Soil substrate is the big one, makes a huge difference. Um, I think the forest nursery at the time was using a peat composted bark. I'm not sure if they're still using it, but it worked really well for our purposes. And we also used a peat uh, vermiculite sand and loam mixture, which also works. Not sunshine mix, that's fungal suppressive, and not high pH. That the fungi do not like that high pH. Seedling age, we tried to inoculate really young seedlings early on. They hadn't formed side short roots yet, so uh, that didn't work. Usually the older seedlings, maybe a year, you could maybe push it back um, a few months, uh, up, then up to a year and a half, and then inoculate. It takes weeks to months for those mycorrhizae to form. Watering, just no chlorinated water, if at all possible. We sometimes leave our water in, in buckets and let the chlorine uh, come off um, before we use it. Fertilization, the main thing here is minimize, minimize, minimize. Um, you could stop it one month before inoculation. You can use a low nitrogen fertilizer, um, which has worked for us, or just fertilize left off, less often. But if a plant is well fertilized with lots of nitrogen especially, it does not need the mycorrhizal fungi. So it's one or the other. So you've got to minimize the nitrogen for the to mycorrhizae to form. We found that fresh spore slurry is best. We've done it with dried material. It's not too bad. Soil inoculum is slow. Cattle vaccination gun works. Drip works, but it's laborious. And we've discovered that some strains of fungi are better than others, and we like to keep our fungi uh, in the same seed zones for, for white bark pine. So here just at the end, a little bit of results from uh, our studies. This is a greenhouse study where uh, seedlings were uh, eventually were planted in burn soil. And at the left, you see those that are colonized. They had uh, 1.7 times greater biomass, and they had uh, 1.66 times greater nitrogen than the uncolonized seedlings. We did an isotope analysis that showed us that this response was due to the uh, mycorrhizal fungi. We did come across some problems. One thing to think about is that inoculation does not necessarily mean that seedlings are going to become colonized. So we'll inoculate lots of seedlings, but only a percentage become colonized. If the soil substrate's wrong, none will become colonized. If we get it just right, maybe 100%, but it's typically more like 20, 50 to 70% colonized. Strangely enough, from the Idaho Forest Nursery, we get some uninoculated seedlings that can be colonized by native fungi. They, they're surrounded by them in the area, and we've DNA tested to see that, yes, they are native fungi. So for experiments, we need to assess colonization not just inoculation. That's fine for the greenhouse. But when you get into field studies, it gets complicated because it's really difficult to um, assess because what you ideally wanna do is right when you're planting the seedlings, go, these are colonized, these are not colonized, tag them as such so you can tell the difference. But often that's not possible. Plus seedlings are bundled, they might come in these boxes, um, they're bagged by the tree planters, they're all together. Um, 
they're bare root in a lot of cases. So they're touching the colonized and the uncolonized. So um, it's hard to set up a good field experiment and we need a long-term assessment for these. So this is our experiment in the gravelly mountains. Um, severe burn. We had a lot of beetle killed trees prior to the burn, so it's a double whammy out there. We figured there can't be very many mycorrhizal fungi. Our bioassay showed us that that was true. We took the trouble to sort the trees while they were in storage before they were being planted and tried to tag them as colonized or not. It's not perfect. And then we GPS them. And this is an area in the gravelies, southwest Montana, where they're planting about 36,000 seedlings each year. We're following 1,600 of those. Here's just some preliminary results. Here's our GPS points. Um, two transects on this site. The blue is the highest health rating. This is, these are just very early results. You can see that just starting that the uncolonized seedlings um, are starting to get green and red bars, red or dead, blue are the healthiest. And the same thing, we see that on site two. So we're just getting started. We're hoping to do more long-term monitoring here. So when to inoculate? Well, if it's a light burn, as we've discovered, the mycorrhizal fungi may not be reduced. It might not be necessary. Severe burn, they are reduced. Is it a beetle killed area? Mycorrhizal fungi could be reduced. Rust killed areas, especially if these uh, forests have been dead for a while. However, is there a source of inoculum nearby? Is there mature living trees nearby that could provide um, mycorrhizal fungi, and especially if there are squirrels and deer in the area, they will eat those mycorrhizal fungi in the mature forest, run into the burn, defecate. There's spores that are viable, and they will help inoculate the seedlings. So if that whole system's present, fine. If not, then you might have to think about um, inoculation. And we think it's economically feasible for the greenhouse. So I uh, just want to, here's uh, some acknowledgments of some of the people that have worked on this project. This is out in the gravelies. I'm not going to read the names. You can see them and some of our cooperators. Um, this was a day when it snowed and the seedlings were hard to find. So we had to go away and come back again. That didn't work out very well. Uh, also, I just want you to know that I put a lot of references at the end of this talk. And so um, they're there for you. So with that, I see that Megan is coming online here. And Excellent. with that, I will see if I can figure out where my question. Yes, is. so yeah, at the bottom of the screen, Whoop. there should be the Q&A. Q&A? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little button that you wanna pop up. And it's up to you if you wanna keep sharing your screen or not. Um, if, okay. you might, if you think you might wanna scroll back into your presentation, you can right keep here. sharing your screen. It doesn't matter either way. Well, we'll just see if I can pull that up again. And I think if you just maybe go back with your arrow for a couple. Okay. All I'm seeing is a black screen. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, on that. So while we're working on that. There you go. Got it. And then we can go. Yep. Yeah. So handouts for this presentation. Megan, is, there, is this available otherwise? Yeah, so we were recording this talk. Um, somebody asked if there were handouts for the presentation. We record all of our webinars. They will be um, available on our website in the next day or two. So no, um, no handouts per se, but it's up to Kathy. If, if you want to provide a PDF of your talk, then somebody can print it out. But I always leave that up to the speaker um, just because it's up to you. Okay, well, I'll see what I, what I could come up with for maybe a PDF file or something. Awesome, like that. that would be great. Uh, a lot of people do, yeah, okay. Yeah, cool. maybe I can put that on my website if, if we can't do it here. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, biochar, no, we haven't tested biochar, and we, we've thought about that. We know that there's some connection with uh, biochar and mycorrhizal fungi. Um, there's uh, studies in Europe uh, but we have not tested it in ours. We've tested burned soil, but not biochar per se. Um, do you want to read? Do you want to read Helen's question, or do you want me to read it? Just so uh, we can 
keep it. Oh, oh I'm knows. sorry. Yes. That's okay. Do you only find these mushrooms in the area of the pine or do they grow elsewhere as, as well? Um, no, only in the area of the pine, although they can be out away from the edge of the forest. And I like to look in uh, pure white bark pine forest to find these. If you find them in lodgepole pine, you're finding something different. Although I've noticed that once in a while, those five needle pines get down into lodgepole pine. And so you might see Sewillus Sibiricus down in the lodgepoles because there's a five needle pine hiding in there. Um, when you collect, is there a percentage that is recommended to leave behind in the field? This is from Linda Shepard. Um, I try to take just enough for what our needs are and leave the rest. It depends on the year though. If it's really, really dry, I might get a little greedy and uh, this is what we need for the year. Um, if it's a plentiful year, I'll just take what we need. So I, I can't give you a specific percentage. It depends on are they out that year or are they hard to find that year. Real quick before we move on, um, I'm going to, we have about 260 people still in the meeting room, um, but I want to make sure that before everybody um, jets out that we um, have, everybody has the ability to um, tune in to our survey at the end. So please answer those questions before you check out for the day and I will pass back over to you, Kathy. Sorry about that. Okay. So rainwater, yes, rainwater can be used um, for the water, and that would be good. As long as it's not chlorinated, you're fine, um, or not seriously chlorinate, chlorinated. Um, yes, there's a lot of micro products, other garden products. I can tell you that I've tested some of those. Um, some of those uh, are not that worthwhile. Others are and it depends on getting something from a reputable company which i'm not going to say here but you can look online for reputable companies you also need to know what are you adding this to so there's certainly not going to be anything you can buy for white bark pine you want native fungi you don't want to add any alien fungi to that system if it's a seedling that's going into a yard uh, or an urban setting some of the commercial inocula can be fine, but know your tr tree species. Um, maple trees need AM fungi. Oak trees need ectomycorrhizal fungi. So you look that up online and see what kind of uh, tree, uh, fungus your tree needs and also what kind of soil it's going to be planted in. So yes, there are some good products. You almost need to test them one-on-one -on -one to see if it'll work in your case. So Nick asks, can you please expound on how nitrogen-rich fertilizer suppresses ECM development? I, I'm not going to go into the exact mechanism details, but basically the mycorrhizal fungi are helping um, pull in nitrogen from the soil. If the seedling needs nitrogen and it's not available, it's going to turn to the fungus for that nitrogen. If there's plenty of nitrogen that's easily accessible, then that seedling doesn't need the fungus. So why should they join up with the roots? So mycorrhizae in that case probably won't even form. The seedling's just getting nitrogen, plenty of nitrogen right from the soil. So it's an either or um, situation. Carl asked about, um putting the references in the chat box. Carl, we'll have a PDF of this so you can grab um, whatever references you want. Yeah, we'll um, try to get a PDF out and, and maybe, yeah, we'll let you know how we're gonna do that. And Larry asks, after a hot fire, how long does it take for mycorrhizae for white bark to recover? Well, it's interesting. We did a study on one severe burn and we looked at uh, seedlings after five years after the burn and basically they haven't quite recovered yet what happens is it's kind of a teeter-totter in the mature forest you have uh, on those seedlings that were coming up a diversity of mycorrhizal fungi in the burn not very many over the years it starts to build up again after five years we did not have a full recovery of the soiloids yet and some people think it might take 
even 10 years for that to come back. But of course, it's different in every situation. It depends how fast those, those fungi um, are, are coming. Uh, are the cones yeah, ever serotonous? Sorry. Um, I'm not that I've noticed. I found a few cones that have opened for various circumstances, but basically it's the birds that are that are opening those and, and not from fire. Is there any micro micro hyzel succession? Can you understand what that person asked? Yes. Is there any mycorrhizal succession um, occurring on the white bark pine root with age? Um, probably yes. And I would love to do a study like that. Um, some of the roots of the older seedlings are, are hard to find, hard to look at. They're down deep and in the rocks and in the crevices. But typically with pines, there is a mycorrhizal succession. We do know that at least the suiloids appear to start early and they can carry through um, to the life of the tree. But later on, we do see some late successional mycorrhizal species only in the older forest, but we haven't done a specific study on that. That's anecdotal. Um, just a reminder, if you haven't taken the poll, please let us know. There's still about 40 people that haven't voted. Um, helps me do my job better. Um, Antoinette wants to know, how do they find your research? Okay, so go to Montana State University and go to the Plant Sciences and Plant Pathology Department. Find faculty and you'll find me. And I'll see what I'm allowed to put up on that website. But my papers are there. We'll, we'll at least see that. Has there been any study or thought to field inoculation in existing young natural regeneration in white bark pine, meaning not seedlings from a nursery? Yeah, we have thought about that. And actually, at one time, we'd made little um, square pellets with the mycorrhizal uh, spores inside that could just be added to those seedlings. Um, so far the research has shown that it's better to jump start them in the nursery. We know that works. Out in the field um, we haven't had that much luck. Uh, it could be possible but there's a whole body of research on mycorrhizal fungi. Very few of those studies show that it works but once in a while yes. Carl brought to your attention that NRCS had a webinar on this very same topic today, so. Oh my gosh, Interesting. we missed it. <laughs> yeah, we missed it. Yeah. Uh, Ward, um, we are Ward in BC, we are inoculating white bark with blister rust in a resistant selection program and one cohort had a lot of mortality in year one, wondering if they were missing mycorrhizae. Can mycorrhizae help protect young trees from blister rust infection severity? Excellent question. I would love to show that. I think, um, so you're in British Columbia. Um, no, we don't know that. And the probably one of the best ways to show it would be actually in your system. So if some of your seed seedlings were colonized and some of them were not, you just need to pull them out of those containers and check, put them in two batches, expose them to the rust, see what happens. We don't have any evidence of that so far, but it would be really exciting if we could show that and the other nurseries might be able to do the same. Um, some nurseries don't have natural mycorrhizae in them, like the, the forest nursery um, in Idaho. But yes, excellent question. How do you store the slurry or do you store the dried mushrooms and make the slurry fresh just before inoculation? Um, both. And you can see that there's kind of a timing issue. And I forgot to mention that a lot of these fungi come out in the fall. So that's kind of late for the year. So that would be um, August, September, October. We make that slurry. Um, if it's not too late to inoculate one-year-old seedlings, we'll go ahead and do it. Then we'll store it in the refrigerator and not inoculate next year's seedlings. We've also done it from dried material that we just reconstitute with water. And it seems to be a little bit s slower and it seems to like to go through a cold stratification process before it catches up with the other one. So either way. Okay. 
Do you want to keep answering questions? We have about 10. Okay. I think. Oh, well, I don't know. What's your time schedule? Here? Oh, no, it's totally fine. You can go as long as you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, although severe burns eliminate, can spores remain viable? In some cases, yes. They've done some studies in California. They're that spore bank. If the fire doesn't burn too deeply, the spore bank can remain and they can come back from that spore bank. Um, the soil that we tested was in the top. I would say eight inches of soil, and we did not find any mycorrhizal fungi. That's unusual. Usually there's something in there, like a, an E-strain fungus um, that's, that's still surviving. Other than for your research, are the districts and parks actively planting white bark pine, inoculating seedlings as a normal part of their operations? And if so, is the nursery doing that for them at an added cost or are the districts and parks doing the inoculating on their own at the nursery or when they take delivery of the seedlings? So this is not being done on, uh, on part of normal operations. Um, right now it's in the research stage. So most of those inoculated seedlings were either the ones that we inoculated or as I mentioned, some of the ones that are being um, naturally colonized um, in the forest nursery. So no, it's not being done on a large scale yet, although a lot of nurseries are interested. Do you know of similar studies or work with ponderosa pine and dug fir and other Rocky Mountain species that need this? Um, there have been a lot of studies on inoculating ponderosa pine, Douglas fir in containers. Um, one of the problems with doing some of the work like this is those field studies. And I, as I mentioned, inoculation doesn't necessarily mean colonization. So what you end up with for the results is not necessarily a spectacular increase in survival, sometimes because um, the colonized seedlings are really not all colonized. I mean, they've been inoculated, they're not all colonized. Also, if there are native mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, seedlings can pick that up. So we don't have any um, spectacular studies for these trees um, showing how that works. So it's, the field studies are, are, are different, difficult. Um, somebody asked, do you have thoughts on the symbiotic relationship and chances for seedling survival if they get infected in the field with blister rust disease? Yes, and we don't have any evidence for that now, but as I mentioned to the previous person who's testing the rust in the nursery, it just occurs to me that that is an experiment just waiting to happen. If you have inoculated and uninoculated seedlings in a batch, expose them to the rust, see what happens, let me know. I think that's probably a good way to start, but so far we have no evidence of that. Um, Paul asks, are there any mycorrhizal fungi of white bark pine also associated with understory shrubs? Can any native plants indicate soils that may still have mycorrhizal fungi? Hi, Paul. Hope you're having a good day. Um, actually, um, let's see, I want to talk not, people talk about um, vaccinium um, that was in a, a thesis, but um, we haven't found any good connection there. Um, while white bark pine sometimes grows better with that plant, there's some new studies um, showing that it does, but not a mycorrhiza collection or not connection. We don't know why. Arctostaphylus, interestingly, at the lower elevations can host some of the same fungi, but it's usually not up as high as a white bark pine. If it was, that would be great. Arctostaphylus can hold some of these mycorrhizal fungi. Mm -hmm. And then Ed has a question. Um, as a general statement, if you see trees with single white bark pine, white bark pine stems, might these be nursery stock versus multi-stem trees, which might be native? Well, one way, I, it's interesting. If you're looking in the field and you're just still looking at not necessarily trees, but seedlings, the planted seedlings tend to persist in the containers for a while before they send out their roots. So it's almost a different form for those younger seedlings and you can tell which ones are planted. Um, when you get to the older seedlings, um, I don't know. Um, you can still see singles, singles in uh, natural settings as well. 
Well, Kathy, you have brought a wealth of knowledge to our audience on this topic, and I really appreciate you taking the time to share your research and your findings and your excitement for future studies and research um, on this project. And thank you so much um, for joining us today. Please um, stay tuned, and we will have this webinar posted to our website in the next day or two. And hopefully, if Montana State will let you, we will get a PDF posted as well so that all of those references and images, can you can study them a little bit more and, um, yeah, go from there. So thank you again, Kathy, um, and we will um, sign off for this month. Have okay, a wonderful day, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for everyone joining us. We'll see Thank if we can get that out to you, that information. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.